Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to Edible Education 101. I'm Will Rosenzweig. I'm happy to be joined tonight by our fearless leader, Alice Waters, is here. And we have a very uh, special program for you tonight. I think many of you know that, uh, regrettably, Eric Schlosser was not able to join us tonight. But as fate played out, Gary Hirschberg, who is a good friend of Eric's, was going to come tonight to listen to Eric speak. They both appear, as you know, in the Food, Inc. movie. And uh, when we heard this news from Eric, Alice and I jumped into motion. And we're grateful that Gary has transformed himself from a guest tonight to a featured speaker. So he'll be joining us. Yes, thank you, Gary, for that. And Paul Shapiro is here as well from the uh, American Humane Society. So it's a very interesting uh, program. Before we get started, a couple of an announcements. Um, first, can, I, can we turn the volume down just a little bit, or do I have to do that up here? Yeah. OK. Um, quick shout out for three outstanding papers this week. Um, and I'd love it if you would come down and meet Alice quickly after class. Um, Kelly Bennett, where are you? Kelly, you here tonight? Atisha Lewis Baptiste, I know, is ill, but we wanted to give her a shout out. And Jonas Majewski, where are you, Jonas? Jonas, good job. Let's have a hand for these excellent papers. Um, Gary and Paul, what we, we assigned a paper that was basically um, said something like, your aunt has just left you $250,000 in her will and um, is encouraging you to open a restaurant that can serve food in an innovative way that meets some aspirations around health and sustainability. And the assignment asks you to um, define and clarify and articulate three values that you think will make the restaurant a success. And then pick one simple dish on the menu after you've described the restaurant in vivid detail and trace its um, origin and preparation and basically bring transparency to it. It was a challenging um, assignment. We got some really, really great um, feedback. So in the news this week, uh, I would say food safety is sort of top of the news this week. Two people regrettably died this week in New York for eating, eating raw milk cheese. Um, a second federal lawsuit has been filed against the soy nut butter company where 16 people have uh, gotten sick and eight have been seriously hospitalized. And there are 10 people currently sick in Oregon with E. coli. So Again, just signals we want you to pay attention to, and you want to pay attention to that in the context of the discussion about agencies, government agencies that work to protect the well-being of consumers at the FDA, the USDA, the EPA, lots of agencies that um, touch and interact with our food system. OK, so this is quick. Um, I clicker roll call here. Ag gag A is a reflex farmer's experience when using fertilizer in the field. B is a law that keeps people from saying bad things about the ag industry. And C is a rule that prohibits undercover unemployment in the agriculture business. Go ahead and vote. OK. Good. What, what, what was the thumbs down for? OK. All right. OK, let's do, a, let's do a show of hands then. Who thinks it's a gag reflex? Who thinks it's a law that keeps people from saying bad things? And C, who thinks it's a rule that prohibits? It is C for all of you that read the paper. Good job. OK. One more question here. This is a, a picture of Alice and Bob Kennard, one of the legendary uh, farmers here in Sonoma County. Uh, 
really a, a dear spirit in the world of gardening and farming. It's actually my gardening mentor too. And this is a, a beautiful picture of Alice and Bob in the field. I wanted to ask you how many of you would be interested in attending a half day visit to Canard Farm after finals are over this semester, sometime in May. Let's have a show of hands. Put them up high. Okay, good. Looks like about 75 people. And here's the tough question in case we have to look for financing. How many of you would be willing to pay for your transportation? Enable. Okay, good. All right, so we're going to work on organizing a field trip. I think that would be a, just a crowning component to Edible Education 101. Maybe we can even find a date when Alice can go with us. Who knows? All right, we're going to return to our favorite subject here at Edible Ed this week, transparency. And this week, we're going to be looking into how um, entrepreneurship and activism come together to generate uh, more transparency in the world. And then Paul's going to talk about the, um, the world of transparency in the um, animal kingdom. So I, as I said earlier, I'm just really grateful to uh, have Gary Hirschberg here. Gary's actually a hero of mine. I think I was figuring out, I think I met Gary about 28 years ago at a social venture network uh, meeting. And Gary had started uh, a company called Stonyfield Farms and was very um, clear about his intent. And his story is interesting because he came from the environmental movement. He was the executive director of a very respected environmental um, sort of research and activism organization on the East Coast. But out of necessity, he felt that he needed to move into the world of entrepreneurship and business to make change in the world. So uh, I want to kind of kick off uh, Gary's intro by showing you uh, a quick video. Let me see if I can get this. Well, I can't. Hmm. Let's see if I can get this to work. Last week, um, when Gary got the call that he was not only going to come to class, but that he was going to speak, we were actually standing in the Anaheim Convention Center where this clip from Food, Inc. starts. So let me show it to you, and let me make sure the audio... I could use a little help up here from my... Here we go. Make sure the audio is working on that. Okay, let's see if this works. Uh, this is our new organic line of popcorn. This is Midas Soy Soy Milk, the best soy milk in the entire world. This, this entire show, when it first started, was the size of this column right here. Uh -huh. Several of us were sleeping in our booths. We couldn't afford hotel rooms. Organic's been growing over 20% annually. It's one of the fastest growing segments in the food industry. We're not gonna get rid of capitalism. Certainly we're not gonna get rid of it in the time that we need to arrest global warming and reverse the toxification of our air, our food, and our water. We need to be much more urgent. And if we attempt to make the perfect the enemy of the good and to say we're only going to buy food from the, from the most perfect system within 100 miles of us, we're never going to get there. OK, well, with that word, I think we're really lucky tonight to have one of the truly um, outstanding leaders in the organic food movement and um, has also recently served as the chairman of the Just Label It campaign. So without further ado, please welcome Gary Hirschberg. Do you want me to put that up? That's uh, fine. Or, or nah, this one? That's okay. We'll Should I turn this off yeah, then? Yeah, we'll just shut it off. That's okay. I'm gonna... Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you guys. Thank you, Will. Um, is this on? Yes? No? Oh. Yes. Now it's on. Um, so I've been planning this speech for weeks and weeks. No, that's not uh, obviously true. Uh, but I, uh, and I, and I, 
want to say I, I will come back when Eric is here. Eric is an absolute treat. And I'm thrilled to be here with Paul, one of the organizations that are, I'm, I, I consider one of the most respected organizations working on our, on behalf of a good food system in the world. So this, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing you as well. Uh, this is what I want to talk about. I want to uh, talk about this intersection of business and activism um, by using the example of the uh, GMO labeling effort that is actually still happening as we speak right now. Although, as you'll hear in a moment, many people feel like it was lost already, far from it. Um, I, I want to just start by telling you my little story. Will got it going, but uh, I was uh, running this Ecological Research Institute back on Cape Cod back in the 1970s, and uh, Ronald Reagan came in and slashed all funding for organic research suddenly leaving all of us in renewable energy, organics, uh, absolutely without uh, any source of revenue. And, the, and of course, the, the whole safety net for our society was also pulled out as, as uh, food assistance for low-income people and, and, and health care and so on uh, was also, uh, dry, also dried up very fast. This may sound familiar. Uh, frankly, at this moment, I, I long for Ronald Reagan. I wish we had him uh, compared to what we have now, but that's a different topic. Um, nonetheless, he forced a lot of us to rethink what we were doing. And so, as Will said, um, my partner and I, we were running, uh, I was the, uh, on the board of a little organic farming school at the same time, and we decided we better um, uh, try to come up with another means of support. And we would eat his delicious yogurt at every board meeting from his one cow, and we decided to start selling that. Well, that today is a $400 million company. We support 1,800 family farms, average of 90 cows per farm, uh, and uh, literally uh, several million acres of chemical-free agriculture. But even more, we're part of a movement that has become an industry. You couldn't even use the words organic and industry in the same sentence back when we started. I often say we had a wonderful company back then. We just had no supply and no demand. Uh, no one really kind of knew what we were talking about when we were talking about problems in the food system back in the late 70s and 80s, but we certainly know that today. And there's a few other pieces of news this week that I'm going to allude to in a moment because it's a very interesting time for us to be talking, as I'll explain in a second. Uh, but nonetheless, we got um, this whole industry kind of emerged out of a, a need for a, a more just and um, a sensible system, a system that did not exist as, the 20th, as, as we lived in the 20th century with a, a foundation of myths. And if you look back at commerce, as we came through the 20th century, you realize that we were, we sort of built industry, built business, built commerce on, on several foundational myths. The, the most, uh, um, among them, uh, that the earth was a subsidiary of our economics, right? That it's there for the taking and the dumping. When, of course, the exact reciprocal is what's true. Our, all economies have been made possible by a bountiful earth, but in our sort of pea brains, uh, you know, we're slow to evolve as humans. Uh, we, we have this kind of rational approach to an, to a, 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 an ecologic system. We just really failed to understand that. We had the myth of uh, waste, this idea that we could allow ourselves to produce things that toxify and disrupt ecosystems and literally kill off and extinguish species, uh, that that is somehow a tolerable behavior. Uh, and then we had the myth of away, that place, that, that mythological place where we send our waste. And of course, climate change is evidence that there is no such thing as a way. It's, if, if it's going up into the atmosphere, it it's, has a, an impact. And I suppose the final and the sort of umbrella myth is the myth of externalities, this idea that um, we can, uh, that in business, we don't account for those direct consequences of our economic behaviors, the toxification, the depletion, the extinction, the, the, um, the uh, selection of wealthy versus poor, the exploitation of those without. All those are direct consequences of many of our economic choices, but we don't, as business people, we're not, uh, we're not forced by any measure to, to measure those in our, how we define our businesses. And uh, so the organic industry really emerged as a one answer uh, to all of that uh, by saying, look, it's impar important for us to be accountable for these externalities, for how we treat animals, for how we treat the planet, for minimizing waste. And really, organics boils down to a, a seeing ourselves as in part, being in partnership with the earth, that, the, that in, in organics, we're rebuilding topsoils. It's not enough to deplete less or slower. We have to actually take 
carbon out of the atmosphere, fix it, put it back into soil. And, as a res and in fact, we have. I'm involved with farms. I've been involved with, obviously, hundreds of them that uh, have now uh, started in literally sand pits, uh, areas that uh, one farm that I'm involved with in New Hampshire was a turf farm for uh, 25 years, which means that every time you take a layer of turf off, you also take topsoil and you export it. So by the time uh, Meg and I uh, got, my wife I'm pointing to here, uh, got involved with this, uh, it was like a sand pit. The, there was no topsoil. The, the, the sand was blowing in our faces. And we put a, helped to put an organic, a diversified organic farmer on this operation. It's about 600 acres. And in four years, the soil has literally turned black, using hogs and chickens to refertilize and, and nitrogen-fixing crops and so on. And organics can do that. It can be not just... Lessen, lessening, it can not only lessen our negative impacts, but it can actually be restorative. And so organics by 2011 in, in my career and across the nation and around the world had been growing 20% annually, as I said in the film. Uh, the great news is at that time it was around a $30 billion sector, um, representing about three and a half, four percent of U.S. food. Today it's up over 40%, 40, 40 billion, uh, up over five or six percent. Um, and we were really enjoying, and, and much like many of us politically thought and had the illusion in the last eight years with a, an African-American president and a, in, an imminent women president, we had had this illusion that we had somehow arrived. So we too in the organic world have had the illusion that we've, we've got wind at our backs. We're really, uh, this is the way the food industry is going. And I have no doubt it, it is, but the problem is, is that we're about 5% of U.S. food. And even more importantly, we're about 1% of U.S. agriculture. And so in 2011, I kind of had this epiphany. I had been growing my little company from our then seven cows when we started. Uh, we grew from one to seven in our first year. It was a major growth year. Uh, and uh, we, um, we uh, had uh, been really proud of this compounded growth rate. And at the very same time, uh, I noted in 2011 that genetically engineered alfalfa suddenly got approved for use across the country. Now, Time doesn't allow me to go into all the details I want, but alfalfa is primarily used for feed. And that what was interesting about this is that the genetically engineered alfalfa that the government, and by the way, the, this is the Obama administration, supposedly the good guys, uh, had approved, it was engineered to do what? It was engineered to withstand uh, uh, glyphosate, Roundup, as we would know it, an herbicide. It was, it was a glyphosate-resistant alfalfa. And what was really interesting about that is that no one was calling for a glyphosate-resistant alfalfa. Only about 7% of the U.S. farmers were even using herbicides in, in, in uh, alfalfa growing. And so I, I, I wondered aloud as an uh, observer of all this, wh why? Why was this crop being introduced and why did it just sail through uh, and get rubber stamp administrative approval when the good guys were on the watch? Uh, well, it turns out that what I learned then really changed my life forever. And um, and uh, it, what I learned is that uh, this, had, this crop was just one in a long string of crops engineered to enable greater use of this very, very profitable chemical, which is now today, by the way, the most used agrochemical on the planet. Uh, glyphosate is, um, uh, is, uh, it was introduced um, in this country in 1996, or I should say, genetically engineered crops that were resistant to glyphosate were introduced in 96. And in that time, it grew to over a half a billion pounds in use in the US. It's now well over a billion pounds. Um, and uh, something in, in the order, since 1974, when glyphosate was actually introduced, something in the order of two million tons have been applied to US fields. Two thirds of that volume has been sprayed in the last 10 years. This is an herbicide. It's meant to address the problem of weeds competing with crops. Uh, but the, a recent analysis showed uh, it just this year that glyphosate is now uh, roughly 0.8 pounds, almost a pound, for every acre of cultivated cropland in the U.S. Uh, and about a half a pound worldwide. Now, why is that? Uh, why should we be concerned about that? And by the way, the U.S. Geological Survey in, 19, uh, uh, in 2011, when I was becoming aware of this, reported even then that depending on the time of year, 70 to 100 percent of the rainwater in our ag lands, ma mainly our crop lands in the Midwest, uh, contain glyphosate in the rainwater. In other words, when we sprayed 
and, and rain fell, it fixed the uh, chemical and brought it into the rainwater. So that meant that if you're, if you're drinking water, if you're playing in a, on a soccer field in Iowa, you're getting glyphosate on your skin, the largest organ on your body, and so forth. Now what was really stunning to me about this whole thing was not only the approval of this new crop, but when I started to look at it, I realized that as proud as I was of organics growth rate at 20% annual, I noticed that glyphosate had been growing at about 30% annually. And in fact, in the time since 2011, it's been growing close to 40% annually. Um, you can probably imagine that when you're overusing, like with antibiotics, and I'm sure Paul will speak about antibiotics, when you overuse a, 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 a useful thing, uh, you can make it useless. At, Antibiotic resistance would be the, the analogy here. In this case, the onset of this much glyphosate in use out there has led to a whole generation of uh, resistant weeds. Weeds that, that, you know, in nature, nature doesn't wait around to do focus groups when it's under assault, right? It just mutates quickly. And in the very short period since 1996, since these genetically engineered herbicide tolerant crops were introduced, and farmers were therefore able to put more and more glyphosate on. You understand this, right? When the crop is resistant, you can put as much glyphosate down as you want without adversely affecting your crop. And so farmers now had this sort of lazy free ride to uh, deal with their weeds. But what happened is the weeds said, no way, I'm not going to uh, stand for this. And they began to evolve. And I was testifying about this in Arkansas at a state hearing. And a farmer um, who had uh, a forearm about the diameter of my thigh uh, said, uh, got up and he said, yeah, I got, I got uh, pigweed in my uh, soy fields. That's the diameter of my, uh, my, my wrist. And th I'm talking about like this. I mean, he, and he said, and the only way, he said, it's 12 feet tall. Uh, it'll stop my combine in its tracks. He said, it's all over my fields. And it won't, it's now resistant to spray. The only way I can take it down is with a chainsaw. Now, uh, you know, obviously that's an added cost to this farmer. Well, it turns out, uh, resistant superweeds are all across this country. Uh, some 90 million acres are covered now with these weeds. And in our inimitable wisdom, as we have evolved now these weeds that are resistant to an overused herbicide, we've developed stronger herbicides. We've gone back to some that were used in Vietnam to defoliate. Uh, and we have a long uh, multi-generational legacy of overusing something called 2,4-D. Um, uh, you may know it as Agent Orange where we now have multiple generations, generational uh, impacts of birth defects and cancers and uh, fertility problems and all, all manner of health issues because of overusing that uh, particular chemical. And now in our wisdom, what we've done to deal with resistant weeds is we've, farmers have been recommended for the last four or five years to use a solution of, add a 10% solution of 2,4-D to your glyphosate and that'll overcome the resistant. Well, guess what, we've now got 2,4-D resistant weeds. A weed scientist friend of mine, if you don't, like me, have the American Weed Science Journal on your bedside, I will tell you, um, uh, uh, this uh, guy, Dave Mortensen, one of the heroes out there from Penn State, reported this year that in Indiana, north to south, east to west, there were already 2,4-D resistant weeds out there even before planting season. So we have this same feedback system that we are in our simplistic mind as humans, we impose these simple uh, single variant solutions, and we get feedback from nature that says that doesn't work. And there's plenty, by the way, I'm not going to get into it tonight, though I would be happy to in the Q&A. There's all kinds of other solutions uh, to herbicide as a, as a solution for weed control. That farm I just mentioned um, is highly, pro in New Hampshire, is highly productive with no recourse to herbicides. So I mentioned this week. So uh, what have we got going here? Well, first of all, uh, last week, uh, 100 wines were tested for glyphosate in Northern California. 10% of those were organic. All 100 were found with traces of glyphosate in them. No one uses glyphosate on grapes. It's endemic in the environment. Yes, there's some weed control done of the pathways, uh, but it's in, and, and it was in 10 of 10 organic grapes, okay, at much lower levels than the conventional, but nonetheless present. Um, uh, one important thing that you should understand, uh, I, I, I take it for granted that you do understand this, but um, let me underscore, the, uh, the WHO uh, three years ago found glyphosate to be a probable carcinogen. Um, the president's cancer panel, when Obama took office, uh, showed that 41% of Americans 
alive at that time were going to be diagnosed with cancer in our lifetimes. What's striking about that number, striking about that study was, first of all, it was twice the number when Ronald Reagan took president. We, it was 20% only in 1981. It had gone to 41%. Who knows what the number is today? And what was also striking is that these, ec these oncologists, um, they pointed to one single factor as the primary cause of this incredible uh, rate of uh, cancer growth, and that's inadvertent exposure to chemicals in our everyday behavior. So if you're pregnant if, in, in the Midwest, if you're playing soccer and you pick up the so soccer ball on the grass and you go in for lunch uh, and you don't wash your hands, you've got glyphosate on you. So we have been in a, in a brilliant economic system, right? You, the, the farmers sell these seeds that are very, I mean, the farmers buy these seeds that are very expensive and then buy the glyphosate that is uh, uh, almost a re requirement of the seeds, which is also very expensive, um, and, uh, and, and uh, essentially lose control of their food system. So this week we have the example of the grapes. We also have an example that California is the first state, and this happened yesterday, uh, to now require Monsanto to label Roundup as a, as a carcinogen. Uh, so congratulations, California. Um, <laughs> Once, once again, uh, you know, unique on, in, in the country, certainly, if not the world. Yesterday, uh, just yesterday in Bloomberg, uh, we had uh, a report that the Environmental Protection Agency official who was in charge of evaluating the cancer uh, risk of Monsanto has, uh, was caught, allegedly, was caught uh, bragging, and there's actually phone tapes, uh, to company executives at Monsanto that he deserved a medal if he could kill uh, another agency's investigation into Monsanto. In other words, you had this, we know that we've just had a corporate coup in America, right? I hope you understand that's what this election is. Uh, but here the, we understand that the, that the reach of Monsanto, the reach of Dow, the reach of DuPont into our policy goes long, way back before this administration. And now we have actual objective <coughs> testimony to the fact that an agency, a regulator, was actually working in concert to try to stop uh, the analysis that led to the cancer finding by of the WHO. And then finally, uh, on the not so good news side, uh, yesterday uh, in Europe, uh, the European Chemical Agency um, uh, determined that glyphosate is not going to be classified as a carcinogen because they were lobbied uh, at the EU into only measuring uh, the pro hazardous properties of the substance and not the likelihood of exposure. And I've just spent 15 minutes telling you the likelihood of exposure now in this country is 100%. So I want you to know I'm not the most depressing guy on earth, and I promise you I will move you through this, but you need to understand the gravity of what we're talking about here. GMOs is not just about GMOs. First of all, there's no proven yield increases from GMOs, and that's a different topic altogether, but there's literally no proven yield increases. GM GMOs have been used, 90% of them, as an enabler of increased herbicide use, period, end of story. And, it, and this is why we, as and, and by the way, the other significant point about 2011 when I discovered the alfalfa was that I noted that this alfalfa was getting approved with zero citizen input. So what we had here was an on-ramp, an approval process that was strictly at the kind of regulatory level, level with you and I not being involved. So my pers back to my personal story, I realized it wasn't enough to keep building a wonderful company in our little sort of 5% niche, that it was time to address policy. And I was shocked, frankly, by uh, the lack of activism uh, in this area. For sure, there were several incredible groups. Consumers Union had published an amazing uh, text on uh, showing, called Failure to Yield, showing that in the years since the first GE crops were introduced, there had been no proven yield increases. But nonetheless, um, these, uh, like I said there, earlier, there was a, a long, long roster of these uh, genetically engineered crops still, still in the pipeline to be improved, and many have been since. So I, what I recognize, and many of my colleagues recognize, and this is how, why we found, started Just Label It, is that unless we had the right to know and choose as citizens whether or not to support this, we were going to be, market forces could not be harnessed. We were going to be left out of the whole equation. And so we started Just Label It. We pulled together a large number of uh, organic and non-GMO companies uh, and activist groups, and, and, and with the Center for Food Safety, got 1.3 million people to sign a petition to the federal government demanding, to the FDA demanding mandatory labeling of genetically engineered foods. Now you, I need to pause and tell you, 
Even by that time, 64 nations around the world had the right to label. Really progressive countries like Russia and China and Saudi Arabia gave their citizens the right uh, to, you know, women can't drive in Saudi Arabia, but they have the right to know whether their foods contain GMOs. And we didn't have that here, uh, strange as that may seem. Now, it, it's not so strange when you look at the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars that have been spent to block and prevent labeling in, in this sort of um, very uh, elaborate and, and uh, sophisticated effort to prevent our right to know. And again, I, I want to go back to that keyword profits. These are, this is an incredibly profitable business model. The seeds are profitable, the chemicals are profitable, the combination is uber profitable, and they use, as a part of the cost of that business model, they use a large, uh, a significant percentage to spend on lobbying efforts. And as you know, we don't really have elections these days, we have sales, and that's exactly what happened. My own state of New Hampshire, 742,000 voters, uh, the, 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 the election for Senate this last cycle was 142 million dollars was spent. And I promise you, it didn't come from inside our state. So you get these mega interests out there fighting to buy whoever it is, and this is the net result. So we petitioned, uh, the federal government ignored our petition, and uh, therefore a whole series of state efforts began. And time doesn't really allow me to get into this, but you probably, many of you probably knew here in California, you had Prop 37. Uh, which was an effort to get mandatory labeling done at the state level with the federal government not being responsive. Um, it failed, but, uh, but it got very close. We were within 1.2 percentage points of winning that, and, and we were outspent 55 million against labeling to 5 million for labeling. That gives you a sense of the kind of the playing field. Uh, and, uh, referendum 522 in Washington uh, almost passed, lost by 800 votes. Probably didn't lose because we, some votes were thrown out. Um, but nonetheless, uh, I'm sorry, in Oregon it was 800 votes. Around the state, uh, effort after effort was emerging, and, and it, finally it passed in Vermont. It passed because uh, it passed at the legislative level, not a, as a citizen's referendum, and so the money uh, wasn't quite as effective there. Um, the federal government took on uh, figuring that, so seeing this mega trend and uh, pushed by the Monsantos and the Dows and the DuPonts who felt that their business model was being threatened, uh, to, to uh, put together an act um, uh, by, inc incidentally, the new head of the CIA, uh, who was a congressman at the time, Mike Pompeo, called the Dark Act. We called it the Dark Act for denying Americans the right to know. This was an effort to stop states from uh, acting up. Uh, you know, many, many times in history, states have had to take act when uh, the federal government doesn't work. Even the w right to vote began in the states. Uh, but here, they just thought the be they better put an end, quelch this fire. Um, three tries of the Dark Act kept failing, and the reason was because Just Label and Center for Food Safety and, and many other wonderful organizations were absolutely avalanching Congress with um, last year more uh, comments uh, in, during an election year, more comments on GMO labeling than any other issue at every senator, at every office, both Republican and Democrat. So this was a wonder, an, an incredible example of the power of citizens uh, to stop, um, to, to have an impact. And so time after time, the Dark Act kept coming up. Finally, finally, it went through, and it went through in June. And it was an imperfect bill, but it, it had at least gotten rid of some of the more egregious aspects. And the, most, the main reason it went through is that it, was a mandatory, it required mandatory labeling, not voluntary labeling, starting in July of 2018. Now again, time doesn't allow, I, I'm gonna say it again, it's an imperfect bill. And there's a couple reasons that it's imperfect, and I want to get to them, but I really want to come to the point of all of this. Uh, so where we are right now is that this bill required the USDA to undergo a process of evaluating um, what should be the code, what should be the rule, how should companies be allowed to label. And the law, the imperfect part of this is that we were pushing for two simple words on the ingredient label, contains genetically engineered soy or genetically engineered uh, whatever. Um, but uh, what industry uh, pushed at when they realized that they were, gonna, they were going to have to face up to either state-by-state state regulations, sort of a patchwork quilt around the country, or agree to a federal mandatory standard because we had at least gotten that through, uh, they started pushing this really uh, uh, ridiculous idea of using a QR code uh, as a way of identifying, which is obviously a way of obfuscating, of hiding. Can you imagine you're walking down, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, go on Just Label, it's website, you'll see a 
little, a fun little video we did with Gwyneth Paltrow showing what it's like for a mom walking down the aisle to stop, you know, and try to, you know, get her scanner lined up to see and, 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 and then how it's going to be scanned and what happens if you don't have a cell phone and what happens if there's not um, uh, internet service where you are in the store. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's a zillion reasons why it's just a terrible idea. Not to mention, no one uses QR codes. I forgot to say the obvious. So, so we're hard at work pressing on the USDA. Even now, even in this world where um, it's obviously gone you know, overboard in terms of the irrationality of, of our federal process, but we're pushing uh, to make sure that, for example, one of the requirements which we, our coalition, got into the bill was that they had to do a consumer study of attitudes towards the QR code. Because we already know 95% of people said they're not going to use it. And so we actually got that study funded. It's actually underway. So to cut to the quick on this, I, I, I want to just say there's a bunch of issues. There's a bunch of work. If you're interested in this, go to justlabelit.org and you can understand the things that we're doing right now. This is not dead. Uh, it is very much alive. There is a chance of actually getting mandatory uh, legislation, which will then allow you to look and pick. And then we know what's going to happen. Companies will move away from GMOs because no, I have yet to meet the consumer who wants more glyphosate in their food, right? Maybe, maybe, maybe there's somebody out there. Um, but the, 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 there are a lot of details. We have to align with other, other nations' standards. We have to define the size of the wording. We have to marginalize or narrow the use of this QR code. And frankly, we have to press on companies to embarrass them not to use the damn thing. And you should know that there's some heroes out there. Uh, Campbell's, uh, Dannon, M&M Mars uh, have said they're going to just pr pr use the words. They're not going to do the QR code. It's going to be right there, plain, plain as could be. Denise Morrison from Campbell's understands. She's seen the consumer research. They've done it. And yet you have plenty of other companies who are, um, who are ready, by the way, to comply with Vermont's bill, which was going to take effect on July 1st until uh, this bill got signed. So there's, uh, as I say, there's lots and lots of issues, lots of questions uh, uh, that we, and lots of navigation here to get through, to get this thing done. And it's gonna be critical that once again, we citizens speak up because we're gonna have a comment period. We're gonna have the ability to testify, to say the QR code is BS. Uh, just give me, you know, give me the straight, straight dope. But what I really wanna tell you about here in my final minutes is there have been some sober learnings for me in this process, because as Will described, I started as an environmental activist, went into business, built this company, uh, was part and am part of a, uh, a rapidly growing sector, and then have gone back to uh, working as an activist, even as I continue in my business career. Um, and I just want to suggest to you that um, there's a, it, 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 this is a fascinating example, and you'll hear another one in just a few moments. Of, of the intersection of activism and commerce. And knowing that many of you are obviously looking ahead to your careers in business, I think it's worth just spending a couple minutes looking at that. Because for me, it's been completely eye-opening. And as I say, I have a foot in both worlds. So, um, and, and, and let me also be sure I am clear that you understand just how critical it is that we understand this intersection right now. Because What's going on in D.C. is not just about, uh, it's not just a, an irrational system. There is an overt and concerted campaign now to eliminate environmental and health regulation. And if you, if, you're not, if you don't know what I'm saying, you're not paying attention. At all of these agencies, you've got agency heads who want to dismantle 30 and 40 years of hard-won rights. My own governor in New Hampshire right now is petitioning the EPA chief, who is not the protector of the environment, he's been trying to undo the EPA, to, uh, to free New Hampshire from being responsible, accountable for clean water regulations. I mean, there's, a, there's an, a concerted effort to undo everything that has built this good food movement. And just as we thought, you know, we had arrived somewhere under the Obama administration, I think we've had a wake-up call that we all need to be involved with, which is, of course, one of the underpinnings of this course. I mean, you've heard about efforts to withdraw carbon pollution regulations. Uh, what you're, what's receiving less attention are proposals to withdraw rules uh, that are designed to protect all of our drinking water, uh, all of our farmland, all of our farm workers, uh, all of us. Uh, so this is more than about labeling. But labeling the right of us to use the marketplace to gain our, to, to express our choice, our opinion. 
you know, we, is, 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 is actually an incredibly poignant issue here. Um, you know, there's, uh, we make a big deal about these elections where we vote every two or four years. But actually, we vote every single time we shop and purchase and go to a restaurant and go to a store. Whether you go to a farmer's market or a supermarket, you're expressing a choice. And those market forces are, are, are in my opinion, uh, the most powerful forces to be harnessed. Um, and yet, during our battle, uh, I, will, I have to tell you that the coalition that we had built has actually kind of fallen apart, uh, sadly. And it needs to be rebuilt, and we're rebuilding it right now concertedly. Why did it fall apart? With the very few minutes uh, remaining, let me just summarize a couple of key reasons. One, uh, well, let me just give you a, a, a quick analogy so you understand where I'm coming from. I coached soccer for 18 years. I had boys and I had girls. And I, I assume many of you have played soccer. And, and, and you're going to have to forgive my sexism, but I come at this from experience, okay? My boys' teams, it was really simple. You had to remind them that they had teammates. There was no problem. They knew exactly where the goal was, and each individual little guy full of testosterone was going to go all the way down the field against the other 11 opponents all by himself, forget the teammates, hell or high water. The girls, I had to remind them there was a goal. Because it was all about the process, like who got to touch the ball and what did she say to me last night and should I pass to her or not? It was like a psychological exercise. Um, by the way, the girls were a far, far better at being a team than the boys. I had, I, they were, it was absolutely brilliant. If I could get them clicking together, I mean, no one could touch them. They could pass, they could see each other. Instead of 11 individuals, they, they, they were a unit. What I'm saying to you is that there were two kind of different cultural phenomena at play here. And I've, in my experience, I'm sorry to tell you that I've discovered that there's two different cultural phenomena also out there in the world of activism and business. And, and we must find a way to pull them together. And I'm assuming that you're taking this course because you're interested in being an activist business person. So what I've discovered is that, first of all, we, like the soccer analogy, we speak different languages. Um, activists are really big at sizzle and numbers, right? And, and as I mentioned, we got more numbers out on, and on these senators' backs than, uh, than any other uh, topic, any other issue last year, thanks to the passion, thanks to the incredible um, work of countless numbers of activist organizations. But the problem was when the senators then got, excuse me, got, got all this pressure, they weren't the, the there wasn't a set of solutions available for, to them as to what to do. On the one hand, they had hundreds of millions of dollars of lobbying and opponents telling them, no, 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 no mandatory, no labeling, no, you know, you got to use the QR code, uh, we got to stop the states. And on the other hand, they needed solutions. And so uh, others of us, uh, notably, uh, primarily the business folks, were in there talking to them and parsing and working on the solutions to all the zillions of issues that were necessary to build a bill. But I got attacked, and you may have seen this in the social media, as, as selling out because I was in there talking, working on this stuff. In fact, I was literally accused of trading away uh, the rights of, uh, of, of uh, activists, of, of, uh, of, of, of uh, all of us who wanted labeling. It, it, it was it, an absolute, from the left, mind you, from my side, I had more difficulties than from the other side. The other side's easy. They just want to make money and slam us. But on my side, I didn't even know how to deal with it. When friends of mine were, were, were and who I brought into meetings and could see that we were negotiating on this, were accusing me of selling out because I was part of the process. And I'm not saying this is you know, generic, just as the boy-girl example is not, you know, I'm exaggerating it to make a point. And, and, and clearly, uh, I'm exaggerating this. But the point is that there was a fundamental distrust of, of staying outside and going in. The activist groups among us, uh, why did they abandon the cause after we lost this bill? Because they don't trust the federal government, and probably with some good reason, right? Uh, and yet, um, what ended up happening is that um, uh, they wanted the state regulations. What ended up happening is when we lost uh, the st Vermont, it got preempted by, uh, by, ca by uh, the federal law, and this QR code was attached. Many of them threw up their hands, put out the word that we lost, we've uh, just labeled it, sold us out. You know, there was this sort of circular firing squad thing on the left that was really a step back for us at a, at a time when we need to be redoubling our efforts as never before, because now, forgive the pun, but we're into the weeds of getting this, this thing done. Um, the, in my experience, um, you know, uh, the activists who brought so much passion and energy to this thing 
Un unfortunately, uh, we're all about the perfect being the enemy of the good. And the QR code was a very emotional uh, uh, facet of this thing. And believe me, it's a joke, right? It's absurd. I'm opposed to it too. But nonetheless, getting a mandatory bill and then the ability to pressure companies to embarrass them not to use it is a lot better than having a voluntary bill where they wouldn't have any requirement at all. And so again, this was a difficult uh, coming together. Um, you know, business has the other, the business folks had the other problem, which is that we're often very bottom line focused and forget the, the, the whole system in which we're working. So I'll just conclude by saying this. You know, the intersection, in nature, there's a, there's some, a, a metaphor that I think you'll appreciate, and I, and I find it's really useful in explaining this. It's called the ecotone. And if you don't remember Ecology 101, let me just remind you what that is. The ecotone is the place where two ecosystems meet. So think of the salt marsh. It's neither terrestrial nor aquatic. It's land trying to take over the water, and it's water trying to take over the land. And you have tides rising. But guess what happens at the ecotone? It is the most dynamic place of nutrient exchange. Runoff from the land, um, nutrients uh, drifting in from the sea. You have much more, most species are bred in the ecotone. Think of the edge of the forest. You get sun, uh, so you get grass for animals to eat. You have woods for protection. So the animals are hanging out at the edge. They don't want to be out in the open because they'll be preyed upon. So guess what? They're dropping a lot of manure there. There's a lot more life. There's a lot more species on the ecotone, on the edge. Well, we are on the edge right now. This is an ecotone. Are we going to have a system where a, a, a truly democratic marketplace, where we have the rights to know and the rights to choose? All we're asking for is two simple words. This is not, you know, all we want is the same rights that the Russians have, right? Okay, this is not that complicated. Um, but, uh, but, but likewise, it's an ecos ecotone between the activists who want it all and business who wants to ha enjoy commerce to move us from 5% organic to 10, 20, 30, 50. You know, all food before World War I was organic, all food. We think it's this like radical thing. What's radical is using chemicals in our food system. People say it's organic isn't proven. I say to you, it's the chemicals that are not proven. All we want is to bring back some rationality and create the kinds of jobs and commerce and safety for farm workers and, and animals and, 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 and humans uh, that's out there. But we have to find a way to jive. And in the end, I go back to something I said earlier. 41% um, in, in 2008, 41% of us, almost one in two, are gonna be diagnosed with cancer in our lifetimes, judged not by a group of ecologists, by oncologists, uh, as the, with the primary cause being inadvertent exposure to chemicals in our everyday use. I would bet you, I would bet you that that number's up over 50% right now, okay? We've had nothing but a rise in this stuff. So this is the mandate of the hour. Now, of course, we have lots of mandates of the hour, and you're about to hear about another one. But, but I would submit that the biggest mandate is, uh, and the nexus, the hopeful opportunity here, is the place where activism and commerce comes together is in numbers of us. Boots on the ground. The power of one. We will never have the money that the other side had. We got outspent just, you know, countless numbers to one, and yet we managed to get a mandatory bill in there. It's not a perfect bill, but it's something to work with, okay? And, and you know, I, 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 I tell you that, uh, you know, the power of, of my activist colleagues and friends and my organization, to, to bring science to, in, to, to people and to get people to express themselves has absolutely been realized in, my, in, in this experience. It was the most empowering thing I've ever seen to have these senators from ag states getting hammered, hammered by their constituents um, to, uh, to, to allow for mandatory uh, labeling. We need, and, and by the way, business needs the very same numbers to be buying and patronizing and supporting us. Uh, it's called market share. So this is where we come together. And I'll, I'll just uh, leave on this point that um, Gandhi really said this best. He said, anyone who thinks they're too small to make a difference has never been in bed with a mosquito. And um, actually, it was the Dalai Lama who said that. And, you know, uh, what I would suggest to you is that, you know, organic has never set out to be food for the elite, for the 5%. You know, there's 10,000 reasons to eat organic food. There's one reason many people can't. It's unaffordable. It's too expensive. The, the gap between organic and conventional is too great. The only solution I know for how to bring that gap down is scale, is to get more acres, more farmers, more consumers, more of us 
supporting a system and making it a part of everyday commerce. Uh, we have the means. It's us. It's us. And this administration right now is going to test that resolve, right? Can we pull together? You know, I, I would submit to you that uh, every single day uh, that uh, there, we're going to see another flare go up. Obama tap my emails or whatever the heck it is, you know, this week. Uh, and, it's, and part of it is a strategy to keep us focused on our individual issues. The issue that brings us together is our rights, our rights to know, our, our rights to have a safe food system. And we can do this. We've proven that we can do it. We got it a long way, but we hadn't built an, a deep enough foundation. And it tested us, and we fell, in the case of labeling, we fell apart a little, and we've got to rebuild it. So I'm uh, obviously uh, excited to talk to you more about this in the Q&A after we hear uh, from Paul. So thank you for hearing me out. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Paul, let's give everybody just like a second to stand up, stretch for a second. Um, I was going to ask Rohini to introduce you. Okay. Would that be okay? Yeah, of course. Okay. And I think I'm going to stay up here rather yeah. than. Okay. This. Okay. That's great. great. So you're good to go with this. Yeah. And we are this. Great. Okay. And cool. this. Okay. Okay, I just wanted you to, to take that in. That was a very powerful and moving presentation by Gary. We never let you down here at uh, Edible Ed. We, we pack every night full with um, really potent content and important speeches. We're going to come back uh, and talk with Gary a little bit uh, to circle back. I'd like to invite Rohini, our um, graduate student instructor, to come up and introduce Paul. It was really Rohini's uh, input into the syllabus on a really personal basis to um, make sure that this topic around animal welfare and policy was highlighted. And so I thought it'd be really appropriate for Rohini to introduce Paul. Thanks, Rohini. Can you hear me? Hi, everyone. As you know, my name is Rohini. Um, I'm really excited for tonight, as I think animal health failure is an extremely important issue that's largely not talked about. I think that's because, well, it's uncomfortable and also because of the corporations who control what we see and why. Um, with that, I'll introduce Paul, who is really a leader in farm animal protection. Um, so everybody, welcome Paul Shapiro. <laughs> Well, thank you so much to Rohini, and thank you to UC Berkeley Edible Schoolyard Project. I am thrilled to be here. It's a real honor to be on stage with Gary. I appreciate his presentation, and more importantly, what he's done with his life, because there's many people who see a problem, and they lament it, they curse it, they condemn it. There's few people who decide they want to devote their life to tackling that problem, and Gary is one of them. So please give it up for Gary again. All right. If you think about the last year or two in news about animals and the human-animal relationship with them, some of the first things that come to mind might be, everybody remember Harambe? All right, Harambe. The lowland gorilla in the Cincinnati Zoo, who when a young unfortunate boy fell into his enclosure, he appeared to be trying to help him, but things didn't work out that so, so well for Harambe, and we all know the end of the story. Harambe was shot and killed. Or think about maybe a story like Cecil the lion. Many of you remember two years ago, Cecil was hanging out in Zimbabwe in a national refuge when an American hunter who had traveled all the way across the world to Africa shot and killed Cecil, this very charismatic animal, after all, one of the few lions in the continent of Africa who had a name given to him by humans, generating an outrage around the world over the treatment of this one lion. Now keep in mind, lions are killed every day in Africa. Thousands of lions are hunted every year. But this one lion put a face to American safari goers, and consequently, the world knew about Cecil the lion. 
Or you think about stories like Ringling Brothers, the iconic circus retiring its elephants after criticism over animal cruelty. Now the entire circus is going under a year after it made that announcement. Or SeaWorld saying that it's going to stop its acrobatic entertainment with its orcas and stop breeding them all together, phasing them out. There's no shortage of major stories about animals and the human-animal relationship when we turn on the news. At the same time, if you were to think about what has been the dominant story in the human-animal relationship over the last couple years, I think it would be far more intriguing to look at what has happened with the chicken. Most notably, chickens who are used in the egg industry. Now, how many of you have ever been to a commercial egg factory? Just about 1% of the hands in the room are going up. Now, sometimes people like to think about Old McDonald's Farm when they think about how chickens are raised for eggs. Unfortunately, little could be further from the truth. I'm going to tell you a story. In 2001, and I, I had an opportunity to go to the first egg factory I'd ever been to. It was just a couple hours away from where I lived in Maryland. And I didn't know anything other than that this particular egg factory housed about 800,000 birds. Now, you may think 800,000 was a lot. Back then, it was medium-sized. Today, that would be a relatively small egg factory. And when I went in with my friends, I remember feeling this great sense of dread of what we were about to find out when we walked inside of this factory. The air stunk from miles away. I mean, we didn't even see the building, but we knew that we were near there. If it wasn't for, you look at this building, windowless warehouses, if it wasn't for the stench, you'd have no idea that animals, let alone nearly a million of them, called this facility their home. We walked up to the barn. I remember reaching my arm out. I was so nervous. My heart was pounding in my throat. I grabbed the doorknob, turned it uh, clockwise, and pulled this door toward us, and this darkness seemed to engulf the local space in front of us. We couldn't even see a yard inside of the factory. We stepped inside, closed the door behind us, and it was now so dark we couldn't even see our hand in front of our face. I turned on a headlamp, and as far as the light would shine, it was nothing but manure and flies. We were in the manure pit of this egg factory. And I knew as soon as we looked up, there they would be. Looked up, thousands of yellow feet clutching gray metal wiring and a sea of white feathers. Birds confined in such a cramped way they were unable even to spread their wings. The average amount of space given to each one of these birds in the egg industry is only 67 square inches per bird. Now, if you aren't a mathlete and you don't know what 67 square inches looks like, it's smaller than your iPad. There are virtually no laws regulating how much space these birds must be given and so the voluntary standard, not even all the egg producers even meet the voluntary standard, but the voluntary standard in most of the country is smaller than an iPad's worth of space per bird. Now imagine if the victims of this type of animal cruelty were dogs or cats. It would be a felony in all 50 states. Yet when the victims are chickens, it's not only not a criminal act, it's, con it's considered standard operating practice. And I give this example as just one example that is uh, really illustrative of the way that animals are raised for food in our country today. You may drive and see cattle walking around in pastures, but 99% of the animals we're raising for food in our country come from factory farms, not out on pastures. And the egg industry is just one example. Well, after that conference, or excuse me, after that visit to the egg farm, I took a trip out here to the West Coast from Maryland where the egg industry was convening in Sin City to talk about the future of their industry. I'd never been to Vegas before. I remember getting there. I was so excited to see what it was going to be like. I got to this egg conference. Every person there except for me was a member of the industry, a problem that was compounded by the fact that they were all decades my senior as well. But I remember I stood up during the Q&A of uh, one of these panels. And I had a VHS tape with me. For those of you who are students here, VHS is an archaic technology that we once used to show film. And I stood up and I held up that VHS tape and I asked, it was a VHS that had the footage that I had filmed at that egg factory. And I challenged them to watch it. 
and to defend what they saw. And I asked them, when was the egg industry going to start taking animal cruelty seriously? When were they going to ban battery cages? After all, the European Union just two years prior in 1999 had passed an EU-wide law banning battery cages for laying hens. The silence was dead and palpable. Eventually, one of the people on the panel stood up and he said, sir, we will always use cages. Cages are necessary for raising chickens. In fact, in the 1940s, we used to label our egg cartons as eggs from caged hens, bragging that the birds never touched earth because they were so much cleaner. He said it's impossible to produce eggs without keeping the birds in cages and that trying to even ask the question was indicative of a lack of comprehension about how the egg industry worked. Well, fast forward from then to 15 years today, and you start seeing what could happen. Just like Gary was talking about the intersection of commerce and activism, and now we're beginning to see a cage-free future where the egg industry actually is starting to move away from keeping birds in these cramped cages and toward cage-free systems. Now, no, cage-free does not necessarily mean cruelty-free. It doesn't mean that the birds go outside or are living on old McDonald's farm, but it does mean they have a much better quality of life. They can walk around, they can perch, they can nest, they can lay their eggs in the nest, they can dust bathe. They have a better quality of life. Again, to echo Gary, we shouldn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And in the case of cage-free, no, it doesn't get the birds everything that they deserve, but yes, it is a dramatic improvement for those animals. And just at that time, back in 2001, when I attended that conference, 1% of the egg industry in our country was cage-free. You start seeing in 2005, companies like Whole Foods and one of the competitors at the time, Wild Oats, announced that they would no longer carry eggs from caged hens. And keep in mind, in 2004, Whole Foods was still selling battery cage eggs. 2005, they discontinued it. All of a sudden, more and more companies started. And in 2008, here in California, voters overwhelmingly passed Proposition 2. The egg industry spent $10 million trying to defeat this ballot measure that required better conditions for laying hens and for pigs and for cattle. The egg industry spent $10 million, and yet still two-thirds of California voters decided to vote yes on Proposition 2. Fast forward again to 2015, when it wasn't Whole Foods announcing they were going to stop carrying eggs from caged hens, but rather the biggest egg user in the country, McDonald's, announcing they are going to discontinue their use of eggs from caged hens. What had been de deemed impossible just 15 years ago all of a sudden was looking inevitable after companies like McDonald's were making this announcement. Just as you read the uh, weed encyclopedia or whatever uh, Gary mentioned was the, uh, what was the name of that? The weed, the weed. Journal of Weed Science, thank you. I'm sure you all have subscriptions. I'm sure you also all subscribe to Egg Industry Magazine. Well, you might have missed this issue when McDonald's made its announcement, Egg Industry editorialized that McDonald's cage free decision is a tipping point for the US. It's difficult to overemphasize the significance of McDonald's recent decision. The editor said, I hope I'm wrong about McDonald's being a tipping point regarding cage free egg production in the US. In other words, if you want a emoji to see what that looks like, pretty much looks like that. But in short, it was the tipping point. This really was a Berlin Wall moment for those of us in the animal protection community. A time when this wall that had been constructed that everybody thought would be there for per in perpetuity started crumbling and falling down. And just as they say, so California goes, so goes the nation. As McDonald's goes, so goes the food industry. Just within one year of McDonald's announcement, nearly every major fast food company adopted similar or better policies than what McDonald's did on cage-free eggs. All of the major grocery chains, from Safeway to Walmart and Food Lion and more, adopted similar or better policies to McDonald's on cage-free eggs. All of the major food manufacturers, all of the major food service companies, all of the major hospitality companies adopted policies saying, if you want to sell us eggs going into the future, you're going to have to go cage-free. A complete transformation from impossible to inevitable in just a short amount of time because of the power of these businesses. We didn't pass any law in the Congress 
We didn't pass any law in any major Midwestern egg production states like Iowa or Pennsylvania or Indiana or Minnesota where huge amounts of the egg production in our country comes from. This largely, with some exceptions like California, largely was a market-driven campaign where the biggest egg buyers collectively said in the course of just a couple years, no more eggs from caged hens. Another one you probably read religiously, Meat and Poultry Magazine, well they said that the cage tree controversy continues as the industry scrambles to get on board, concluding it is no longer a discussion about whether to convert egg production from cage to cage tree, but rather when it will happen. Just imagine that trajectory from 15 years ago when egg producers said we will never get rid of cages to now saying it's not only a matter of if, it's only a matter of when. And just this past election cycle, last November, yes, Trump won across in, in enough uh, states to get the presidency, but in Massachusetts, there was a real silver lining. In Massachusetts, there was question three, a ballot measure that mandated that eggs, veal, and pork sold in the Commonwealth to over six million consumers every single day come from only cage-free animals. And despite the ag industry in the Midwest pumping hundreds of thousands of dollars into this campaign, Massachusetts voters decided by a landslide margin, 78 to 22, to vote in favor of question three. Now keep in mind, if you aren't that interested in politics, you don't know, 78, 22, that's not a political landslide. That is a political slaughter. And in my field, we call that an inhumane slaughter at that. <clears throat> now, I've been talking about one specific issue with regard to animal welfare, the treatment of egg-laying hens. Now, it's great that egg-laying hens are seeing a little bit of light. There's a light at the end of the tunnel for them. Cages will be relegated to the dustbin of agricultural history. At the same time, getting rid of cages does not really address the root of the problem that we have with regard to our reliance on a system of factory farming of animals. Getting rid of cages gets rid of a symptom of factory farming. It's critically important to do so. But as one of my heroes, Henry David Thoreau noted, there are thousands hacking at the branches of evil to everyone who is striking at the root. You could go practice by practice, battery cages for chickens, veal crates for calves, <clears throat> uh, gestation crates for pigs. You could also think about castration of pigs in the pork industry. How many of you have a male dog? Anybody, male dog? All right, Rohini, what's your dog's name? Droopy? All right, well, she, she's telling, she wants you to know she did not name him. <laughs> okay, so Droopy, is he, uh, is he neutered? Okay, cool. So. Rohini is an animal welfare advocate, and so she's concerned about pet overpopulation, so Droopy is, has been neutered. Now, what do you think would have happened, Rohini, if you had taken Droopy to the vet and said, hey, I want you to neuter him because I'm concerned about pet overpopulation, too many pets, not enough homes, shelters are overflowing, and your vet says, sure, no problem, Rohini, I'll do it. And he takes out a scalpel and goes to town and cuts off the testicles of Droopy without any pain relief. What do you think would happen to your vet? Get fired. Anybody else have any thoughts? Lose his license, be charged with a crime, animal cruelty, absolutely. But what if it wasn't droopy, and what if it wasn't a vet? What if it was a pig, an animal who feels pain with every bit as much of intensity as a pig, or as a dog, rather, who is even smarter than dogs on IQ tests, and instead of a vet, you have an untrained farmhand with no animal care experience whatsoever, doing the same exact act of unanesthetized castration of animals. Nothing happens because most states exempt customary agricultural practices from their state cruelty codes, meaning that if enough farmers engage in a practice, it de facto becomes, it de facto becomes legal, no matter how cruel it is. The same act that could get you thrown in jail for cutting a dog's testicles off without painkiller has no legal repercussions as a matter of routine course in the beef industry, in the pork industry. And so the point is that there are all types of these inhumane practices, and you can't spend 15 years on each one going industry by industry trying to take care of these. So what is the root of the problem? Well, part of the root of the problem is that we're eating too many animals. That's really what it comes down to. Americans eat more meat on a per capita basis than essentially any other nation on Earth. It is inefficient. It is unsustainable, it is inhumane, it is unhealthy, and we need to start shifting our diet 
from one that is based on eating animals to one that is based on eating plants. And we can do it, in fact, we already are. If you look at the data from food intel companies like Mintel, they say 22 million Americans consider themselves vegetarian. Sounds like a lot, pretty small percentage, only a few percentage points, maybe five or 10 at the most. Many of those who consider themselves vegetarian may not fit the actual definition, but at the same time, the percentage, uh, the percentage of Americans who are cutting back on their use of meat, who are meat reducers, so-called flexitarians or reducitarians, people who don't feel the need to eat meat at every meal, who are eating these meat alternatives, is about a third of all Americans. That is a huge population. In fact, because of these so-called flexitarians, Americans are now eating less meat per capita than we did 10 years ago. For decades, meat consumption on a per person basis just went like this in our country. And now, meat consumption has actually fallen for the first time since World War II. It's truly incredible. Now, some people fight back and they say, well, it's not so much about eating organic or eating plant-based, it's just about eating local. That's the most important thing. The science doesn't really bear that out though. If you look at what the actual science says, here's some studies from uh, Carnegie Mellon finding that just shifting one day a week to a plant-based diet reduces your food print, your carbon food print, by more than eating 100% local. The miles that a food travels is a tiny portion of the total amount of energy used to produce that food. In fact, the cooking method generally has more to do with how much energy you're using than the miles the food traveled. But even more important than the cooking method or the miles traveled is whether that food is animal or plant-based because animal products tend on average to be far more resource inefficient than those that come directly from the earth. And the climate scientists are noting this already. In fact, the United Nations urged just years ago that we need to eat less meat, eggs, and dairy in order to avert the most pressing problems of climate change. You can't read the fine print here. Lesser consumption of animal products necessary to save the world from the worst impacts of climate change, UN report says. The reason for this is pretty clear. Animal agriculture causes about 15% of all the climate changing emissions from humanity. That is roughly the same as all transportation combined, all cars, all trucks, all boats, all planes, all combined. So when we think about climate change, yes, it's easy for us to point our finger and say, oh, bad coal, bad oil. But sometimes we need to realize when we're pointing one finger out, we got three pointing right back at ourselves. And we ought to be a little bit more self-reflective and figure, what can I do to reduce my footprint? And part of it is gonna be eating a little bit lighter and lower on the food chain. As Oxfam, the International Relief Organization, puts it, the reality is that it takes massive amounts of land, water, fertilizer, oil, and other significant resources to produce meat, much more than it requires to grow other nutritious and delicious kinds of foods. Now, some people see this and they think to themselves, aha, I'm gonna do something like a meatless Monday, which is a great thing to do. Other people will think, aha, I'm gonna do something like vegan before 6 p.m. Like Mark Bittman, the food writer and New York Times columnist who many of you know and love as I do. Here's his best-selling book where he talks about how he's a vegan before 6 p.m. and after 6 p.m. he eats whatever the heck he wants. Good for him. That's awesome. Other people want to go further than vegan before 6. They want to be vegan before 6 and vegan after 6. And for them, they look for cool books like, for example, How to Be Vegan, whose author is sitting in our audience right now, Elizabeth Castoria in the front row. who's giving an embarrassed wave like this right now to all of you. I wanna see what number this goes to on Amazon after this, all right? But with good reason, because yes, it helps animals, yes, it helps the planet, but it also helps ourselves. By eating more plants and fewer animals, we can help ourselves. So you look at, for example, the obesity epidemic in our country. 42% of us could be obese by 2030. And for me, this is actually a very personal issue. When I was a kid, I was on track to become obese. Here's me at age, I think, 11. And this wasn't that abnormal for me. You could see I wasn't obese, but I was en route to becoming an obese adult. I was this kid, my father would bring me to football games. I would limit myself to one hot dog per quarter, per quarter. The problem with this is that eating lots of meat is correlated by numerous scientific studies to uh, be correlated with high rates of obesity. 
Johns Hopkins School of Public Health concludes, our analysis shows a consistent positive association between meat consumption and obesity measures among adults. In the biggest study ever done, ever published on the topic, they concluded our results suggest a decrease in meat consumption may improve weight management. Now nationally, more than a third of us eat one, less, one serving of fruit or less per day. Just one serving of fruit or less per day. Same report found that even small, uh, so about a quarter of us eat less, less than one vegetable serving per day. It is truly horrific. <laughs> but what are some of the reasons why we may not want to eat uh, as much vegetarian food? Well, some people may think it's convenience. Some people may say that it's uh, not customary for them. Some people though, We'll make this argument, how many times do you hear this where you hear, it just costs too much, right? How many of you heard that? It costs too much to eat vegetarian or to eat healthy. Almost every hand in the room goes up. I'm here to tell you though, it's not so. In fact, a study that came out just about a year ago found that eating vegetarian can save you on average $700 for your food budget a year. Now you may be thinking, how can I save all that money? Well, good news for you. There is a new resource that is hot off the presses where you can now find an all plant-based meal plan. Every meal, 21 meals for your whole week for only $25, about $3 a day, just over that. And if you wanna get it, all you gotta do is go to plantbasedmealplan.com and sign up and get it, plantbasedmealplan.com. The purveyor of that is also in the audience here, Tony Okamoto, give her a round of applause. It's not just individuals who are reducing their meat consumption. Entire school districts like Oakland have gone meatless on Mondays. They're doing 100% meat-free for their meals on Mondays, and they're doing it both to improve public health, yes, to improve the environment, but also to cut down on their food costs. In fact, some school districts in the country, like the Detroit K-12 system, have gone all meat-free on Mondays, and they liked it so much because they were saving so much money, they're now all meat-free two days a week. One of the pioneers of this movement just published a book. She's been all over the news. Christy Middleton has a new book out called Meat Less about why you don't have to be a vegan if you don't want. You can eat less meat. She's way up in the nosebleeds in the back. Give Christy a round of applause. Here's a, here's a screenshot of Christy on, uh, on the news this week in Sacramento. <clears throat> and the trend is caught on. It's not just school districts. Burger King is now advertising its veggie burger. Here's a photo I took in the airport the other day. A delicious combination of real veggies, brown rice, and rolled oats. Every Burger King in the country, the cheapest burger on the menu. Cheapest thing to get there is their veggie burger, and it's quite good. Also, even the purveyors of some of the highest end dairy products, some of the best treated animals, some of the most conscious companies like Gary, are now producing their own Stonyfield soy, a product that I love and many people here, I actually emailed you about somebody else in the audience who's here who loves your soy. I wanted to find the raspberry because that's what she likes, but I got vanilla for you there. So uh, Chipotle, same thing. Most, uh, most affordable thing on their menu is their uh, chili rubbed uh, sofritas, their tofu. You keep on going and even Fox News now is talking about the benefits of eating less meat. That's how far we have come from us trying to find soy milk in Whole Foods to Fox News talking about why it is beneficial to eat less meat. The NASDAQ recognizes this and they published on nasdaq.com, the death of meat, how meat consumption has been steadily declining, which could play out into huge profit potential. They advised their investors think twice about holding long positions in meat industry stocks or exchange trade, exchange trade for securities. And even just today, and perhaps the, one of the most exciting things that is happening in the world of food entrepreneurship today. Yes, we have plant-based meat companies that are making better and better meat alternatives every day, but we now have a new revolution, the cellular agriculture revolution, where we can now produce real meat without animals. Now this is going to the other end of the spectrum. This is looking for entrepreneurs who want to produce real meat, meat that is identical to the meat that you eat today, without genetic engineering, without genetically modified organisms, and they can produce real meat in the same way that we can, for example, uh, take your skin and produce it in vitro. If you get burned, we can produce your skin and put it on your body, your body doesn't know the difference because there is no difference. Well, there's a Wall Street Journal article out today about a new startup, 
Memphis Meats, based right here, very small company by, run by a bunch of environmentalists who want to make a difference in the world, and they're producing real meat without animals. Very few people on earth have ever eaten this type of meat. It's called clean meat, like clean energy, clean meat. More people have gone to space than have ever eaten that type of meat. You're listening to one of us who has eaten it. But also, there are some people, one of whom is in this audience today, who was there for the unveiling of this. Christy Legawi, give her a round of applause sitting up there. Was there. Her colleague, Emily Bird, who's not here and will be hearing about that later from me, is also up there. They're with the Good Food Institute, a relatively new nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting these type of clean meat technologies. Now, what might the future hold? You see plant-based meat companies, you see Fox talking about eating less meat, you see McDonald's talking about cage-free eggs. What might the future hold? Think about what the world was like in, let's say, the late 19th century. For thousands of years, our main form of transportation was this. For thousands of years. That's how the Romans got around, how the Greeks got around, how Genghis Khan got around, was by horses. And if you were to walk through any of our nation's city streets, let's say in 1880, you would be treated to a lot of unpleasant scenes. You would hear the sounds of cracking whips. You would hear shouting men. And the victims of those shouts and those whips would be the horses, laboring through all weather, heat, cold, rain, snow, to take us and all of our goods throughout our city streets. It wasn't uncommon to see dead horses strewn with lash marks on the side of the road, discarded by their owners, waiting for other surviving equine brethren to come and drag them out of the city. In fact, in 1880, New York City commissioned a panel finding out to ask what it will be like in New York City 100 years from today by 1980. And they concluded that at that time there were 200,000 horses in the city, but by 1980, with population growth as it was, they would need 6 million horses. The city would literally be drowning in manure. There wasn't enough, there just were way too many horses, too much manure, and you know the only way to get the manure out of the city? More horses to drag it out. Huge problem. And yet, because of the innovation of one entrepreneur, flawed though Henry Ford may have been, he did more to free horses from manual labor and our city streets from choking to death in feces than any animal advocate or environmental advocate or city planner could have ever dreamt of doing. At that time, there were all types of animal welfare campaigns, campaigns to get horses, resting hours, watering stations, Sabbath days so they couldn't be worked on Sunday. And yet it was Henry Ford not activists who delivered freedom to those horses and saved New York City from the projections of the best experts of the time who predicted the city would become unlivable. It was Henry Ford through his entrepreneurship who changed the world for horses in the same way, for example, that we used to run on whale oil. And there are all types of concerns, sustainability concerns about whale oil until one entrepreneur and a geologist named Abraham Gesner in the 1850s patented kerosene. All of a sudden, kerosene took over and whales were liberated from our harpoons. All of a sudden, within a few decades, kerosene got rendered obsolete by another inventor, Edison, who gave us the electric light bulb. And so you can see the power of business to improve our lives and to improve the sustainability of what we're doing in the world. So how can we move forward? Well, I think that we're on the cusp of a revolution in how we treat animals. In conclusion, when we think about how we're starting to see animals not just as commodities, not just as objects for us to gawk at or to be entertained by, but we're starting to see them as the individuals who they are. We're starting to see them as individuals who have likes and dislikes and personalities, and most importantly, they want to avoid suffering. Not just celebrity animals like Harambe or like Cecil, but also like the animals who are on our farms. And we're learning that these animals are not mere commodities, that they deserve our compassion, they deserve our respect, that they too have families, they too have interests, they too want to avoid suffering, including even animals who don't breathe the air that we breathe, yet still are caught up in our food system. Now, I know that that type of a world may seem like a radical departure from where we are today. It may seem hard for us to envision a world in which our relationship with our fellow creatures on this planet is one that's no longer based just on violence and domination, but rather is based on compassion and respect. But because of the work of people like you in this room and the entrepreneurs who we've been talking about and the companies from the biggest companies like McDonald's to the smallest startups like Memphis Meats, 
we can create that type of a world. Think about what seemed impossible that ultimately became inevitable. Not just the case of battery cages for egg-laying chickens, but let's say somebody going to prison for nearly three decades and then getting out and becoming president of his nation. And that's exactly what Nelson Mandela did. He said it always seems impossible until it's done. Think about what was legitimate social debate in our own country. 150 years ago, the legitimate debate in our country that you could have a respectable position in society and hold either view was whether one human ought to be able to own another human. And lots of respectable members of society, Congress people, clergy, lawyers, doctors, held both sides of that. 100 years ago, the legitimate debate in our country was whether more than half of us ought to even be able to vote. 50 years ago, the legitimate debate was whether whites and blacks ought to be able to drink from the same water fountain. 10 years ago, the legitimate debate was whether gay Americans deserve the same rights as other Americans. Now, imagine what would happen to you if you were to go tonight and post on Facebook that you took the wrong side on any of those issues, that you said you actually are for human slavery, or you are against women's right to vote, or you thought that gay Americans deserve to be discriminated against, or you are for racial segregation. What do you think would happen to you? You'd be a pariah. It might even make the news. Your friends would unfriend you, yet a blink of an eye ago, historically speaking, that would have been a perfectly respectable view for you to hold. So what might we have in the future with regard to our treatment of animals? Do you think that future generations are going to smile upon our factory farming of animals where we locked them in cages where they could barely move an inch their entire lives? Or that we mutilated their genitals without pain relief as a matter of routine course? or that we doped them up full of antibiotics and hormones just so we could squeeze a few extra pounds out of them or get them to market a few days sooner? How do you think future generations will judge us? I don't think it's going to be that kind. Now, in sum, <clears throat> Gary mentioned uh, the Dalai Lama. I'm going to mention a quick story about Gandhi. A historian came up to Gandhi one time and he said, sir, your object is just too impossible, freeing India from the largest and most powerful empire on earth of Great Britain, and you're not going to fire a single shot? It's not possible. And Gandhi looked at that historian and he said, sir, your job is to write history. Ours is to make it. And that's what your job is. When you go out, when you leave this institution, you go into the world, you can make history, whether it's as an activist, whether it's as an entrepreneur. But the point is, don't sit on the sidelines. Don't let your life be lived in vain. You can help make a difference in this world. You can be a part of this type of narrative of changing the world for the better, giving a voice to the most vulnerable in our society. And it can be whether any of these patterns or these paths that we're talking about, you can make that difference. You can make that change. And I encourage you to get involved. If you want to do it for animals, please, let's talk more about that and make it happen. Thank you very much. Can you help them? Thank you, Paul. Thank you. I'd like to invite uh, Gary and Paul up to the uh, stage here for a sec. And I think. Thank you. I do. Is there another handheld mic? There were several. They both. Okay, great. Um, just a quick note before we um, finish up, too. I just want to remind everybody next week, uh, Davy and Nelson, one of the Kitchen Sisters, is going to be here with Sue Conley and Peggy Smith. And I've got a little slide on that. And um, next week's reading is not a reading. It's actually you get to listen to two podcasts from the Kitchen Sisters. Ah, cool. And um, Alice is going to be here to get them started. But this is uh, next week we're going to talk more kind of building on some of the themes we talked about tonight, but the power of story and narrative to um, change minds. So um, we've got a few minutes left, and uh, I think we'd, it'd be great to have a few questions. I'll come over here and sit with you. Thank you. Um, I know that these kumquats are here for uh, display only, but I'm just going to- They're gonna, for you. All right, I, I just want to break the ice here. One of the things we get- <laughs> benefit from Chez Panisse each week, the, the hand-picked fruit. Mm. Um, take this course. You want to take this course? Good. Yeah. Well, I, I, would, I did want to say, you know, it's very powerful to have these voices here at UC Berkeley because the legacy of this campus and this place as a, um, you know, a, a very fertile environment for 
uh, ideas to turn into action. It's just, it's, there's a history to it and there's a gravity to it. So I'm you know, particularly excited this year, edible education has moved from the School of Journalism where Michael Pollan started and then Mark Bittman uh, taught the class last year in the College of Natural Resources. Now we're here appropriately in the Haas School of Business and it's just really interesting, you know, tonight's topic to see this fusion of sort of progress and action through the marketplace. Yeah. And um, I just want to thank you guys for making that point really clear. W one of the things just from my perspective is, you know, when I roll the, my own tape back to our very first social venture network meeting, there was a whole group of people with really heady ideals about how to change the world. And we're, we're making big claims about how they were going to kind of do better than the status quo, you know, exceed the regulations, make products and sell things that were, you know, better than what the big business was doing. And one of the things that really um, differentiated Gary in this community and was a great inspiration to me was that he delivered. You know, he was, act and, and that sounds like a little thing, but at that point, that was really hard. It was really hard to go and beat the margins of big food. It was hard to beat the muscle and power on the shelf. And this kind of world of communicating the values through the business in very creative and resourceful and entrepreneurial means was kind of the pathway to that. And, um, you know, you and your colleagues, really, and, and some of our friends made that into an art form. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, but Paul yeah. uh, just said it, I think, even better. It, guess what? We didn't do it. You did it. Right. <laughs> our consumers did it. We put the choice out there, but we couldn't guarantee that it was going to happen. Um, you know, and, and, and to be more blunt about it, um, we had no money. We, 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 we were nine years till we made any money. I told you earlier, no supply, no demand. Nobody understood why a yogurt should cost, you know, 30 cents more than the crap that was on the shelf at the time. Well, that stuff on the shelf wasn't actually food. That's why it was so cheap. And, uh, and we had, we were at a loss for how to communicate it. Uh, and so borrowing a page from some of our, you know, incredible educational models out there like HSUS, we, um, we went to our first supermarket. I was selling to six local independent retailers and this one big chain with 35 stores, he said to me, well, um, you know, he called my partner at, at home. He said, why, why aren't you selling to me? And we said, well, we don't have enough cows. He said, well, get some more damn cows. And he slammed the phone down and we took that as good advice. So we grew our herd from seven to 19 cows. And then we got there and he said, well, what are you going to do for advertising? And well, there was no money for advertising. So on the way back, we thought all we had was cows. So we put, came up with this idea of um, uh, allowing people to adopt our live cows. Uh, uh, metaphorically, they would get a, if they sent in five yogurt tops, they would get a certificate naming them the co-owner of the cow. They would get a photograph of their cow. And then in those days, this was, I know you can't imagine this pre-internet, uh, uh, you know, dinosaur age. Um, they, they would get two letters from their cows a year. And the cows would, would talk about amazing stuff, humane treatment, access to pasture, methane emissions, uh, synthetic growth hormone. But to this day, that's still how we market and communicate because we actually believe our money should go to the farmers. And so our farmers are well paid because we want to embrace their practices. And so we use social media now, which is, of course, and nowadays, the cows, by the way, email. There's no paper, and, and they text. So, uh, I'll tell you just a, a brief story. Um, so think about uh, the power. So you know, Gary w was the pioneer on this type of uh, what we call conscious capitalism, these type of socially conscious entrepreneurs who use the power of their business to try to do good in the world. I'll give you a more recent example. There were uh, two dudes, Josh and Josh. And they both were very concerned about the egg industry. They had seen the type of photos that I was showing you. They had uh, been to these egg factories. And they both had been uh, concerned about helping the egg industry move to a cage-free system. Well, going cage-free costs more. Meat reduction costs less, cage-free costs more. And they knew that there were a lot of folks who, there were a lot of products that had eggs in them that 
you really don't necessarily need to have eggs in that you could come up with perhaps plant-based ingredients that could not only take the place of the egg in those products, but actually make the product even cheaper. And so in 2011, they got together and they decided they're gonna start a company called Hampton Creek. Started out here, here in the Bay Area. And fast forward today to six years later, and Hampton Creek now produces just mayo that is sold not just in Whole Foods, their very first customer, but their egg-free mayo routinely outperforms the egg-based mayos in Target and in other major stores like Walmart and so on, and the company has a valuation of over a billion dollars. So six years ago, it didn't exist. It was basically two kids around 30 years old who didn't know anything about business, really. And now there's this company, one of whose representatives is here, Jenna Cameron, sitting in the front. Jenna can wave. Um, but that's the power to solve a problem, that rather than just focus on trying to lament something or curse the problem or try to get everybody to pay more, certainly we want people to not externalize the cost of food. You should pay the cost of the food, and animal cruelty is an externalization. Uh, in this case, though, there are some products like mayo and other products that really didn't even need eggs in them in the first place. And that's an example of a type of company that has done good by doing well. So another thing that's changed um, pretty profoundly over the years is that in the um, early 90s when large, and in, even in the 80s, when large companies started to acquire the smaller companies, um, it was pretty customary for the entrepreneurial founder who was really the keeper of the vision and the values was often just kind of booted out. Um, one of the first um, big acquisitions was really when Ben and Jerry's was acquired by Unilever. And Unilever um, worked with Ben and Jerry to kind of accommodate and create, you know, embed their values a bit. They created a separate board and tried to treat it. And, and they were the first company to start kind of look at hey, maybe there's something we can learn from this. But really what they were learning was that those values were embedded in, in the brand. Um, Gary's story, which we don't have time to talk about tonight, but maybe next semester when you can tell that wonderful snowstorm part of the story. But Gary's company was acquired by Danone. And one of the things that was really remarkable about that was wasn't just that they wanted to sort of protect the values of the, the company, they actually appointed Gary to the board of, of the company, right? So that, you, so that they could sort of learn from, from your practices and have them spread. I remember the first couple years after that, you were traveling all over the world to teach the mega company, the big food company, the practices of the small food company. So I think that's really interesting right now. And we're seeing that more and more, like your point about Campbell's. They bought Plum, but they left it alone. <laughs> Um, they're trying to bring it resources, but they're trying to scale. So I want you to talk a little bit about that, but I also want you to talk about the paradox of like in this just label it, where we've got the, you know, the small companies that are organic and they're on one side of it, but their parent company is you know, through the back door channeling funds to the Grocery Manufacturers Association or other lobbying groups to defeat. So there's a lot of you know, tension and, and kind of schizophrenia going on right now. Yeah, I mean, uh, the big companies want to kind of have it both ways. Uh, the example Will's giving is General Mills, uh, which was one of the major funders of trying to stop Prop 37, nevertheless allowed Annie's, <clears throat> who they bought, to be one of Just Label It's major funders. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we have this example again and again. And this is another of those ecotones, uh, those places where mission is meeting. I mean, let, let me just go back to a slide of Paul's. You showed Tyson up there. Um, yeah. Tyson is now a major investor in Beyond Meat, um, a, a pea protein-based alternative. Uh, General Mills is now an investor down there. You look at the investors in Hampton Creek, you see who's stepping up to the plate. Uh, there will, I'm on the board of a, um, a, a wonderful um, uh, all-vegetarian and vegan meat alternative company called Sweet Earth. Uh, and, and every day the sharks are coming by and swimming. Uh, I've been involved in you know, countless of these. Um, the deal that I did to be very precise and not to belabor but to, to make this point was that we sold them, uh, done on 80% of our company, but they left me with majority control. And you may say, well, that's just counter to all business uh, notions. Well, it, it happened because A, I wasn't gonna sell it without it, and B, they knew that they needed me and my team 
uh, and our notions and our understandings of carbon footprint and that the cows are really the methane source, that that's the biggest part of our footprint. And they, they knew that we understood what the science was and also how to communicate it better than they ever would. And as Will said, we've been reverse engineering it now to the point where Danana is going to buy, if the Department of Justice allows it, White Wave Foods, which is a huge organic uh, holding company. And so we're at this uh, very interesting moment. And there's a lot of, it makes a lot of people nervous, and it should. Uh, there's been some wonderful brands that have been killed in these acquisitions. Uh, Cascadian Farms, a beautiful organic uh, brand that was founded by a friend of ours. Um, I'm not, by the way, you know, there's plenty of us who have been pioneers in this space. Uh, Kashi was an incredible uh, cereal brand that was really badly treated by Kellogg's. Um, but, uh, it's, it, it, but, but with what Paul's talking about and what Will's talking about, with, with better margins and better top line growth, these large companies are learning that the entrepreneur is really critical. Uh, and the value set is nothing that you can mess with. That's really what they're buying. Seth Goldman, I was on his board from Honest Tea. Seth's still an active decision maker uh, leading that brand. You could say, well, he crossed the line and sold to the evil empire. And it's true. I, I mean, I was part of that to Coke. But on the other hand, you know, Coke is not going to sur surrender the keys and just say, Gary, Paul, Will, you know, you guys have won. Here it is. You run this thing, right? I mean, they're going, they're, they, they need us to show them the way. And the kind of values that you just saw in this incredible presentation, uh, there's no doubt that plant-based is going to be 50% of the, uh, uh, of the uh, protein market. Uh, I'm on the board of Forager, if you know that company. Uh, uh, we're good friends with the guy who runs uh, Calafia. Uh, these are rocket ships that are taking off. The bigs are all going to be trying to get in, and they need to. And frankly, it's not a bad thing if we can build the kind of, um, uh, like I did, the kind of uh, uh, rules of the game that keep us and keep our value system protected. And the last thing I want to say very quickly is it all comes back to us, the consumers. If we don't think that these companies in their acquisition, Plum or who, uh, late July or Applegate or whomever, are still uh, pr providing the kind of values that we want to support and subscribe to, then we need to stop purchasing because that is actually the most powerful way to send a message back, which gets me all the way back to this nexus. This is where the activists in business and all of us have to work together in concert. We, th those big companies actually work for us. We actually, their payrolls, their supply chains, everything is generated by us purchasing. And if we don't, and our peers and our family members and our friends don't, you know, boycotts are very, very imp impactful. Um, we, uh, then, 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 then they're going to wilt, then that, that they're not going to make it. Uh, I'll echo what Gary said and just briefly say, so Seth Goldman from Honesty, who is a, a neighbor of mine and a friend of mine who I love, you know, Gary says he sold to the evil empire. I'll just name them. Honest Tea was bought by Coke. And they are still an all-organic tea company. Like, if your goal was to get more organic tea in the world and a greater percentage of tea sold to be organic tea, Coke buying Honest Tea was the best thing that could have possibly happened. And so I supported then and now Seth's decision to do that. I think yeah. he, I think he was the, the right thing to do. Um, and I will note on uh, Sweet Earth, another company. I didn't know you were on the board. That's great. The, but the chairman or the CEO is the former chairman of Burger King, right? right. So right. the former chairman of Burger King is now the CEO of a, a plant-based meat company. The, the times are changing. <laughs> so the key word tonight is ecotone. Let's have um, a question from a student of the class who's got a good question for Paul or Gary. Don't be shy. We just got a minute or two left. Why don't you see who's got a microphone? Guy, uh, right there. I got one. Just introduce yourself quickly and... Hi, I'm Claire. I'm an MBA student here. Um, one of the things I think I struggle with, and kind of to your point of boots on the ground, the more of us who are involved and know these things are, and are making consumer choices the, for the right reasons, the better. Especially coming, you know, there's sort of like a victimization of um, vegetarians, and there's sort of that, that stigma against being the one to say, you know, there's, you know, there's animal cruelty and, and pointing out these things and that's kind of brushed aside a lot. And I'm curious from your perspective, especially from you, Paul, what's kind of the best way to start communicating and get people to listen without kind of being brushed aside as like, oh yeah, the vegetarians are telling us again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Claire, right? Yes. Cool, well thanks for your question, Claire. Claire. Um, <clears throat> so I am one of them and I, I certainly don't feel victimized at the same time. Um, I think it's important, so, you know, I don't want to knock my fellow vegetarians, but, you know, 
it's important whatever group you're in to be a good ambassador for that group. I often say that if you want a, a vegetarian friendly world, you should start by being a friendly vegetarian. And there are a lot of examples where that doesn't happen, unfortunately. And so I think you know, for whatever group you're in, whether you're a vegetarian or, or some other group that you want other people to be more like, it helps to be friendly. It helps to show that it's really not that different from what you already do with your life. I mean, I'll tell people, like I had somebody uh, just the other day um, tell me like, oh, I could totally be vegetarian, but I just can't say no to my mother's, or my, excuse me, my grandmother's uh, Thanksgiving turkey. I was like, then eat, your, eat the turkey. Like, you know, be a vegetarian 364 days a year and eat, make your grandmother feel good on Thanksgiving, do it. Like, you know, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. And this is one of the points that I really like about Christy Middleton's new book, Meat Less, is that it doesn't have to be all or nothing. It's not black or white. There's no such thing as 100% or purity or anything like that. We you send the message that do what you can, that we are in this world as imperfect beings, we're all causing harm, and we ought to try to do the best that we can try to reduce the amount of harm we're causing and do increase the amount of good that we're doing, but not take it to such a point where we feel like this is some type of like an orthodox religion or something like that. And I think that is, would be helpful if more people adopted that mentality. Yeah, and I, I just want to quickly echo, and I, I think this, the perfect as the enemy of the good is a really important, it's this, we're all in a continuous improvement process. The organic world is imperfect. The vegetarian and vegan world is Imperfect, but I, 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 you know, as we're getting to the end, I want to take a page from my old friend Alice's uh, book here because what is happening, in fact, is that, you know, much of what we've generated for um, alternatives to the bad ways of growing food has been done with our brains, but we're finally figuring out it's food. It starts with taste. It's an emotional place, not an intellectual place. The vegan and vegetarian alternatives that are out there taste incredible now. I mean, I, I mentioned a few companies. I could stand up here for a half an hour and list. I mean, we just came back from this expo. It was the plant-based expo. And whether it's, you know, I mean, pasture, eggs are, taste better. And, and you know, so, so I, you know, or I, I'll be the first to admit, when I started in the organic food business, organic used to mean you have to chew extra. Okay? <laughs> I mean, and some of you know what I'm talking about. It was, you know, those extra, you know, gritty pancakes and the, the moths on the broccoli. And, you know, we were sort of doing it with our brains. But now we finally figured out it's about food. And I think if we can understand that this is a sensual, not just an intellectual undertaking, um, and not be arrogant to the point, and, and understand that we're all in a continuous improvement process. And it's all about, you know, founding. We built our planet. We built our our civilizations on myths, right? And we're undoing and we're challenging. And give everyone a break, we can pull this thing t along together. Amen. Well, on that note, I want to thank Gary and Paul tonight. <laughs>